Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Hi, Angela. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm really excited for this episode. I love to talk to students and other advocates. And um, most of all, what I hear from my audience is that they love it too. And that's the goal is to provide good content um, for my audience so that we're kind of meeting them exactly where you are and where they are. Um, Angela, let's go ahead and start off with an introduction. Why don't you tell my audience a little bit about yourself, your family, your work, why you care about special education. Give us an introduction. Okay, well, uh, my name is Angela Tishka and I was born and raised in Michigan. Uh, Before kids, I um, received my bachelor's and my master's degree from Central Michigan University, Fire Up Chips. Um, Now I live about 20 miles north of Detroit with my husband of almost 15 years. We have two sons. Both of them have IEPs. Um, My oldest is Lucas. He's 11. Lucas has a genetic syndrome called Coffin-Cirrus syndrome. It's a rather rare syndrome, but um, it, because of that, he has other disorders like autism epilepsy, cerebral palsy. He has a visual impairment. He's hard of hearing. Um, We just weaned him off his feeding too. Um, So that's good. But we added a CPAP machine just last night as as a matter of fact. So we have lots of challenges and have ever since he was born. Um, He has an IEP um, and is in a special education self-contained classroom. Um, And then I also have a six-year-old, Zach. Zach is in first grade. Um, He has an IEP for speech and ADHD. Um, But he's um, a very active child. He likes to play Minecraft. He loves playing with his neighborhood friends. Um, This spring, he played, or I'm sorry, last fall, he played baseball. And I actually coached his baseball team. So I had 10 little uh, five and six year olds playing baseball and we're starting basketball in a couple of weeks and I'm going to coach him in basketball too. So it should be interesting. As a family, um, we love to go to amusement parks. Um, My 11 year old, you know, um, it's challenging sometimes to take him out in in the community, but we found that he really loves amusement parks. He loves riding rides. Um, they like going, we like going to water parks. So we spend a lot of time, especially in the summer, doing those things as a family. Um, me personally, I love attending concerts. I've went to over a hundred music concerts. So um, pre-COVID, of course. <laughs> right. I'm looking forward to getting back into that after. Uh, that some of this is over. I love to read. I read a ton. I like to hang out with my friends. I'm a big extrovert. So which you'll find out later on, well, I think we're going to talk more about my uh, parent community involvements. Um, so that's pretty much about me. Well, that's awesome. And then your job Um, I know is as a special education advocate. And, you know, I've got a lot of listeners that um, are interested in becoming special education advocates, like we talk about in our lab community and our ABC community. Um, You know, people are oftentimes asking me, how do you do your job? How did you um, learn special education? And how could I become an advocate? And of course, I'm an attorney. It's a different training um, program. But that is probably the question that I am asked most often at the end of representation is, um, first of all, what do we do next? And then 
hey, I'm really interested in doing what you do. So I'm interested. I know a lot of other people are interested in your journey to become a special education advocate. Well, for me, it was really a culmination of a lot of different things. Um, I started out after college, I worked at a law school and I worked in student services for about 14 years, um, doing everything from admissions to financial aid, registration. Um, but the last seven years, I worked as a disability services coordinator. So um, I would make sure that we were in compliance with all the state and federal laws. I'd meet with students and we'd go over you know, um, their documentation, we try to figure out what kind of accommodations would be appropriate for them in law school. Um, I did a lot of academic counseling and that type of thing. And I, I really, really loved my job. It was, I really had a passion for it and I really loved doing it. Um, but when my son was born and we had all the appointments and the therapies and Everything, I mean, I used up every single day of vacation I ever earned taking him to appointments and that type of thing. So, um, you know, I never thought I would be a stay at home mom, but it, it really became a necessity for me to, to come home and stay at home for a while. Um, so during that time to kind of fill my time, I started volunteering for our local parent advisory committee. Um, I was on that. Um, I also started attending a lot of trainings. I did a lot of um, the parent um, training, organization trainings. They had a lot of webinars and free things that you could attend. I went to the rights law conference and I really just started to network with a lot of other parents and professionals in the disability community. Um, I'm also in a lot of social media groups for different disabilities. And I started developing a reputation in, amongst my organizations as someone that had knowledge about the process. So, you know, I had a lot of friends that would call me up or message me and ask me questions and ask for my advice. And um, all these seeds just started to get planted that, you know, maybe I could use my information and my knowledge to help a lot more parents. Um, so this year was the first year that both my kids were back in school. Um, we were remote most of the year last year. So this year was the first year. And I decided I, I really missed having something um, to do to spend my time. Um, and I wanted to do something meaningful. You know, I could go and get a job in retail or working, you know, in service or whatever. But I really wanted to do something that I was passionate about and that um, I, I thought would help a lot of people because that's what I miss most about my job was helping as many people as I could. So um, I started listening to a lot of podcasts. Um, this one in particular, I found your podcast and I started listening to it from the beginning. And then I started re-listening to them. Um, I started <laughs> taking a lot more webinars. Um, I ended up signing up for your ABC training and that really helped me learn kind of the business aspect about starting a business, starting an advocacy company. And then um, as more and more of those seeds are planted, um, my husband was really supportive. He you know, said, you really should do this. Um, I have a mentor who was an advocate um, in the state and I had helped her out. Um, her son actually wanted to go to law school. So I sat down with them and, and kind of gave him some of the lay of the land and some tips and tricks on how to apply to law school. From about July of last year, I submitted my paperwork to the state and became an official corporation and I started accepting clients in November and I've actually had a handful of clients. Um, I started advertising and I've actually had some attorneys that have referred people to me, people that friends of friends, um, legal aid attorneys that I, you know, I don't even know. Uh, I got a call yesterday from a special ed director that um, we had actually met in a mediation with a client. So, um, 
starting to get my information out there and it's I'm really seeing the culmination of my efforts if you will so yeah I'm excited oh, about that. that is wonderful that's the kind of journey um that I think a lot of people are on I think that your story is so relatable. You know, I um, had to make other commitments in order to help my family, but um, because of my personality and my experiences and all of those things kind of all together, I um, then found out that I knew a lot. And by knowing a lot, I thought, well, maybe I could do something with this. Maybe I could help somebody else. Um, that's very similar to my story. Mine, of course, you know, has a law degree in the middle of it, but I was actually at a divorce seminar, a seminar um, about divorce with families that have kids with disabilities. And um, the expert who they brought in from California started saying all these were all the acronyms, you know, they um, had behaviors. And so they did an FBA and developed a BIP and she started saying all the acronyms. And I was like, I know what all of that means. And the more and more she talked that day, I was like, I need to do special education work. And so I did the same thing as you. I just really kind of dove in and um, and got myself trained and started helping people. And um, similarly, I think the need is so significant that I had a very little marketing need. It just kind of like exploded really um, from there. So, and I, and I hear that story time and time again. I'm so happy that the ABC course was there for you and that you, um, as we've talked about before, you found me. Every once in a while, um, we can see when somebody finds me, so to speak, because they download all the freebies, they buy a few products, um, and a lot of them will end up buying the lab um, or inquire about the ABC course, you know, when's it gonna open again? And we could tell when Angela found me, so, um, I'm so happy that that worked out for you, Angela, and I wish you so much success in this business. I'm so excited to continue to hear about it. So let's kind of talk about that community involvement, because I think that that's a key. Um, and I know that that was a key to you kind of exploring this um, practice area or this um, this new career, if we, um, if we could call it that. So I know that you're really passionate about participating in and even organizing parent support groups. Why do you think that parent support groups are so important um, to be in a part of a community? The biggest thing I think is that it gives you support. Um, everyone needs support. And I think the best place to get it is from others that understand. I mean, um, you know, when I meet with my other girlfriends, they understand if that we have to leave early from an event or they understand if we have to cancel at the last minute because we're having behaviors or, you know, we have to go see a specialist or whatever it may be. Um, so just the understanding, I mean, we can sit and talk for hours about our kids and see all the similarities. And um, we also share a lot of resources. Uh, so things like where do you find respite workers or how do you apply for the waivers? Who are the best therapy companies to go with? You know, these are things that other parents and other community members can help with. And it just, you know, it feels really great to have those people that, that understand and, and can empathize with you. Yeah, I echo that. And I think another piece to it is, um, you know, I've had a lot of life experiences, like a lot of people have, that are very perspective shifting. So, you know, I mean, my listeners know I was in a gasoline explosion when I was 15. So I have four compression fractures in my back and chronic pain and um, also PTSD as a result of that. And my husband's had cancer. I've got a kid that has Down syndrome. We've had a lot of doses of anything can happen. And I think all of those experiences and others um, kind of shaped me into this person that likes to go deep. Okay. And when I'm hanging out with other friends or acquaintances that don't have those similar personalities, sometimes it's good for me because it's good to be lighthearted and talk about the Cincinnati Reds. But I really love that my friends that have those um, experiences kind of in their toolkit, their toolkit, um, 
they appreciate that deep dive. And it might not be anything disability specific, but it might be like, you know, my parents are sick and I'm trying to support my parents. And like, you don't just like with your friends in the disability community, that conversation doesn't usually stay like, oh yeah. And I bet your siblings are having a hard time managing. It's like a deep dive into like personalities of the family and um, different, you know, uh, tests that you can do and that kind of thing. And that's probably a bad example, but I just love that with my friends in the disability community, I seem to be able to get 17 layers into the onion faster. And that's really where I, like where my relational mojo is. Do you experience that too? I do. And you know, I was going to ask you if you have this experience too. Um, it seems like everywhere I go, I find other moms or other parents of children with disabilities. So let me give you a couple examples because these, these have happened recently. So um, had an iPad that we were trying to sell on Facebook marketplace. Right. And um, normally this would be my husband's realm. You know, I don't usually meet people, you know, we go to the police station and do all that. And normally he would do that, but he wasn't feeling well. So had this lady that wanted to buy the iPad, took it there. And she's like, Oh my goodness, my son is going to be so happy. This is going to be his talking device. Uh, well. And I'm like, okay, let me, I mean, this involved into a uh, 30 minute conversation about talking devices because my son uses an AAC device as well. So we started talking about that. And I, you know, we started talking about her experiences in her school system. And, you know, so um, it just everywhere I go. Um, I yeah. went recently to get some headshots taken for my promotional pieces. And um, it was weird because on the way there, I started thinking maybe I should have tried to find another mom that I could trade some services for or something. So I, you know, um, and when I got there, I started talking to the photographer and, um, I said, you know, I'm here because, you know, I just started my own business and I need some professional photographs taken. And I said, you know, I'm in special education advocacy and she just stopped and she didn't say anything. And I said, well, I don't know how much you know about special ed. And she started crying. Oh. And she said, um, you know, I almost didn't come into work this morning. I tried to call in and they said they really needed me. She said, but I have a son um, in, in a special education classroom. He's having a lot of behaviors and they keep calling me to come pick him up. And, you know, oh. it's really difficult. So, of course, I gave her my card and I told her to contact me. Um, but it's just these experience. I almost feel like I'm put in these places for a reason because yeah, like, I do too. And it, you know, <laughs> it, I, I I have the same thing. Like I met a mom at a um, swim meet out of town in the hotel. Like we started talking because we were the only people at breakfast at five thirty, and then the next morning um, we were the only people at breakfast at five thirty. <laughs> and then she and I um, were next to one another on treadmills in the hotel gym. And um, it turns out like our kids, we, we knew by this time that our kids like we're swimming the same events and we're very competitive with one another, like not in spirit in actual swimming, like they, mm -hmm. they pushed one another and it was great. Um, and it, the, the son that swims against my Griffin is a twin and, it, and the twin has a disability and, you know, she was kind of lamenting about maybe, I don't remember if it was like not wanting to be out of town that particular weekend or whatever, but we had that connection and it's like an instantaneous connection. And we have maintained friendships at swim meets and um, you know online and beyond. And I agree, it happens so, so frequently. And truly that kind of leads to the next question because my um, preference is my personality style matches up with like one-on-one -on -one connections. Um, and so when Jack was born, I refused any kind of contact from our Down syndrome association because I was like, I've got this ginormous family, this big, um, like ginormous family, this big neighborhood. We both grew up in the community where we live. Um, and so like, we don't need support. And it was very, very soon thereafter that I was like, oh, it's really important to share experiences with people with similar experiences. It's very important to learn from and to be supported by people in my community and more importantly in his community. And I knew that he needed a community 
as he grew. Um, and that has been so, so valuable. But I still tend personality wise towards those one on one connections. Um, but for parents that, you know, aren't finding those one on one connections, need the, the, the bigger support as well, where can they look? How do they find organizations? Well, um, I would ask around, ask other people in your community, um, ask your children's teachers, or maybe if you have a relationship with a special ed director at your school. Um, I found a lot of mine online. Yeah. You know, I, Facebook. I did lots of searches on Facebook and I, you know, at the beginning I joined a ton of different groups and I've kind of whittled some of them down. You know, you, you take what you need from them and some you let go if they don't quite meet your style. Um, but I found a lot of more local groups. I have a group right in my county that we actually, we get together and do a lot of those one-on-ones. We do mom's night outs. We probably do, you know, four or five a year and get together as much as we can. Um, so um, the other thing is that most, um, states, counties have either like a CPAC or a PAC organization. Um, and that's usually representatives from your school district, but a lot of those people know about various organizations. Um, for example, I'm in our county PAC, Parent Advisory Committee. I probably shouldn't use acronyms. We, we get all caught up in the acronyms and we forget that. Not everybody knows those. Um, but our information is on our intermediate school districts website how to contact your parent advisory committee members so um, that would yeah and I think that you know I I encourage my students in my um, ABC course and even my clients to um, get involved sometimes by being surrogates for families um, in their district too a surrogate advocate really just kind of stands in if a parent isn't able to go to a meeting or, um, you know, isn't available, et cetera. And I think that's a good way to get involved also. I have found lots of state committees um, and I serve on, a, I, have, I have and continue to serve on a few state committees. Um, but truly, if it doesn't exist in your region, look for a national organization. You know, if your child has CP and there isn't a CP support group that's local to you, look for a national organization because I feel really old when I say nowadays, um, but seriously, nowadays, it doesn't matter as much that you can't meet the person at the Olive Garden for a six o'clock dinner on a Tuesday, um, tuning in together um, on a Zoom or on a phone call or watching a presentation together can be almost as richy. And I do think there's a lot to that personal connection, but you know, if you're really looking for a connection, I think you can find it. Um, electronically almost as easily nowadays. So, but that kind of leads to the next thing. If, if it doesn't exist, build it, right? Like <laughs> if you can't find a parent support group, another idea would be to build it. And I know that you have helped to build a parent support network or a community group. What kind of advice do you have for people that are looking to do that? Well, you have to be able to go outside of your comfort zone sometimes. You know, I'm an extrovert and so I look for these things, but some people are very introverted and it's more difficult. Um, I started by working collaboratively with my special education administrator. Um, I found that that really gave me access to a lot of resources I wouldn't have had on my own. So now I have access to the teachers and the classrooms and the um, contact information. I mean, I don't have it personally, but I can submit that to the administrator and they can, you know, send the communication out to all the parents. Um, you also may have some funds available by working through your school districts, meeting spaces, things like that. Um, so that's how I started mine. I started it as a parent support and resources group through the school district. Um, and I guess I would say, um, maybe this might kind of go into a different question, but, um, don't try to do it alone. Try to find other people to bring along with you. Um, and don't be discouraged if it doesn't work out right away. 
Um, you know, the thing that I had to put aside, because this is one thing, you know, we, we've had our group now for maybe four years and we haven't seen a lot of growth in it, but I had to look at, you know, was it really the group that was not allowing for the growth or was it the participants? Because, you know, when you look at our lifestyles as um, parents of children with disabilities, I mean, we're probably some of the busiest people on earth, you know, right. taking our kids to all these different therapies and um, different things. So sometimes, you know, it's like, do we have one more hour to give or do we have the time to put into it? So um, I think it's important to just be there when people need you though, you know, because there may come a time where they do have more time and they want to get involved. So, well, and I mean, I agree with what you said about providing programming. Like if it's just getting together for a glass of wine or going to somebody's house, I'm less inclined to do it because I'm really busy. And, you know, I mean, I, I did a podcast episode on being efficient and that's not efficient. Right. <laughs> now it's important. Social connections are important, but it's not something that I really can prioritize, um, particularly now in the middle of a pandemic. But if, if there is a talk on um, potty training or on a special education topic or on, um, you know, kind of a new and improve, a new and upcoming therapy like interoception therapy and you bring in an OT, I'm going to be there, not only because it might help me with my family, but it also, um, in my case, might help my clients, certainly, but might help me connect to other families that are going through something that is similar to mine. So I think the opportunity to learn and to connect socially definitely makes a difference. Um, and, and then you find those similarly minded people, and then you can have those one-on-one -on -one connections, right? Which, you know, I think is what is so cool. Well, and the other thing we did is um, we tried to find um, like natural connections. So for example, um, we have a big special Olympics program in our district where we do track and field in the spring. And, you know, we have a, we don't have a very large school district, but we have a very large special Olympics track and field team. That's we, great. Well, it's open to, you know, people of all ages. So we have former students that come back and participate and that kind of thing. Well, we always have our track and field practices on Tuesday evenings. So, you know, parents are already there supporting yeah. their children. They're bringing their children there. So then we started having our our meetings Tuesday nights so mm -hmm. that we already had a captive audience that were waiting for our, their children at the same time. So looking for some of those natural um, <laughs> connections really helps. Yes, too. I always say I learned and continue to learn so much. Well, I will after the pandemic or whenever it's safe to have a, a like fourth normal life, whatever the new normal is going to be, the new, 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 new normal. <laughs> um, but I've learned so much in the lobby of the Cincinnati Ballet while Jack and his peers are doing their ballet class and in an auditorium while he's at Special Olympic Swimming. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with you that those kind of organic things happen. And so if you're planning an organization, you can take advantage of those as well. Um, Angela, we are gearing up here at Ashley Barlow Co. for our annual conference, and you are a speaker at the conference. Why don't you give us a little preview of your conference topic? Okay. Well, I'm going to be taking my knowledge of higher education and putting it into my presentation. I'm going to be talking about attending college with a disability, some of the facts, myths, tips and tricks that parents, teachers, um, transition coordinators, whoever could use. Um, when I worked in higher ed, I was actually on a professional organization of um, disability services coordinators from all different higher education institutions across our state. And we used to have lots of conversations about um, how can we get the information to our high schools and our you know, our younger kids to let them know what's coming up in the future. Um, you know, we, they would find there was a lot of kids that just didn't really know the process or what they needed to do. And so there were a lot of people falling through the cracks. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the differences in K through 12 versus college, 
um, some of the laws, the responsibilities, um, documentation that you might need, what accommodations might be available, how do parents fit into the process? Um, that's a question I get asked a lot. Um, and I actually, I, I opened it up to my social networks and I, I sent the question to them and I said, what are some things you wanna know about going to college? Or what are, you know, what are some things you've heard or you've not heard? Or so um, I've incorporated a lot of the information that I received from my parent friends into my presentation. Great. Yeah, that's super helpful. I think that's a really, really good idea. And certainly a topic that I see time and time again as being horrendously overlooked and therefore very important in special education. So I am super excited for that because I have oh, I don't know, I've probably sent an email with a link to your particular topic maybe eight or 10 times to clients and former clients because I think it's so important. So yes, well, tell my audience where they can find you in case they are in Michigan or otherwise are interested in connecting with you. Well, I have a Facebook page. It's MI Student Advocacy Services. And um, I also have a website, it's mistudentadvocacy.com. Wonderful. Well, we are so happy to have you not only as a podcast guest, as an ABC student, but also as a speaker at the conference. I hope that you will join us at the second annual virtual free special education and advocacy conference on January 22nd, 2022. Hop over to my website to register. It's entirely free, but if you would like access to everything to the entire conference or you aren't able to attend live on the 22nd, then you can purchase the VIP pass. That's uh, $49 and that will give you all access on demand through at least the end of March. So I hope you'll join us. Angela, thank you so much for joining us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Ashley.